Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 56. TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at Ellis underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at OSP Patrick. And Tidy Explained is on Twitter at Tidy underscore explained. Or you can Gmail us, tidy.explained at gmail.com. You can open up an issue on the GitHub repo. You can like subscribe on the youtube page leave a comment yada 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 We'd love today, to hear from y'all <laughs> today we're back with pitch classification episode, episode four. Four? Four. Yes, four. Four. Four, okay. four four yes four and we've yeah. been doing this for the last couple episodes there is going to be a link down below so you can look at the entire playlist if this is the first episode that you're seeing because we are going to skip over some stuff because we've covered it extensively in yes. the last couple episodes and we are building on last week we did trees and random forests and now we are going to boost those trees <laughs> exactly we're so, going to make them extremely good extreme so, extreme gradient boosting xg boost yes exactly so patrick i'm going to share the screen for you so then you can see what we're talking about as we go through it yes but all right so we don't need the random forest one right now we're talking about xg boost let me quickly update the I got ahead of myself and didn't update the title of our, our markdown. But for go. those of you that are just joining us and have not taken our advice to leave and go look <laughs> at the prior episodes, we were hired, quote unquote, by the Fantasy Baseball League to make predictions on what the pitches or the pitch types that were thrown. We have access to the pitch FX data and we're trying to come up with a machine, machine learning algorithm to do the pitch calling for us so we don't have to have a human sitting in the stands making those calls. Right. All right, so we're gonna get going here. We're um, gonna quickly load our base path with using here, um, just to the folder that we're working in here. We're gonna set our knitter options so that it looks at the correct root directory. And then we're gonna start loading the libraries that we use. So as always, tidyverse. Um, this week we're gonna be using the package xgboost. So we can use boosted trees and the, the boosting algorithm uh, contained within that. Then we're going to use caret and do parallel to once again tune and make our models better. So we're going to get those going there, load in our stuff. Now we're going to load in our data. We're not going to go through this. Look at episode 53. Uh, here's the, the link there. Once again, if you did not take our advice to, to leave now, uh, but we're just going to load in our data do some subsetting cleanup of our um, training and test data sets so that we have data to train and test on. All right, so now we've got that going on, but now we have to do some formatting to actually use our data for XGBoost because XGBoost actually expects a specific type of object, a matrix object, which means, as I think we've talked about in the past, matrix objects require all the content to be of the same class, right? So they all have to be of the same basic class, which is either character or integer or numeric. They, can, they cannot be mixed. Yeah. And so what that means is we have pitches that we have, we're using as factors, right? So we have like the FF, FKC, CU to represent the pitch types we need to now convert those into dummy variables. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about R is it know like it's a, it's statistical language and knows that that happens. And so you can actually just call as numeric on a factor and convert all your factors into numeric values. <laughs> um, so that's what we were going to do here. We're going to call as numeric on train cleaned pitch type. And we're going to subtract one because factors will start at the level one. And what we need to see, feed into XGBoost is everything starting at a level zero up to the number of uh, pitches that we have. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna just do that here. So now in our train or test and train cleaned, we're gonna have a column pitch type num, which is the numeric version of our pitch type. So we can actually do uh, take train cleaned, run it through a distinct to get what the pitch type and pitch num are. So pitch type FF. Type zero, FT is one, SL is two, all the way down to FS, which is the two seam fastball. Four, four seam? One of, one of those. FS, <laughs> FS is F the split, split finger. Split, split finger, we always get that one. Uh, I don't know, for some reason it doesn't like mentally map 
for me. Yeah, FS. why wouldn't it be like SP, split finger, right? SF, maybe. Yeah, it's backwards. Yeah. Split finger, SF. I don't know. What do, what do we know? Yeah. Um, Alrighty. Yeah. So we've got that. So now, now we need to convert them into actual matrices because they're still data frames at this point. So what we're going to do is, it's a little bit nested here, so we're going to take a, a, a second to clear this for you. But what we're going to do is we're going to run this piece here first. So we're going to take train cleaned and we're going to select out. So this is like the inversion. Uh, remove pitch type and pitch type numeric. So these are like our Y, y variables that we care yeah. about. If we want to create train X. So we're going to yes. remove those and then we're going to convert it into a matrix using the function data.matrix. Probably just use as matrix, matrix, any of those work. <laughs> Use data <laughs> Any of them are doing, yeah. Um, so yeah, so what we what we now have here is a matrix. As you can see, it doesn't print very pretty, but it's got uh, it's it contains all the same information because they're all numeric. We didn't have to do any changes to our um, x variables because they weren't categorical. They weren't anything. If we were, we would have had a, we, this would have been a lot more complicated. Yeah, but right. that does bring up a good point. We should we should do a series on feature engineering. Yes, we like should. Like building a big sparse matrix of, you know, features. If this, then not that, then this, then mm -hmm. that, then this, then that. So, I mean, uh, R handles that under the hood for us all the it time. It does, yes. All the time. Yeah. So it, it's and, super nice. When you're dealing with factors and throwing it into your linear model, under the hood, it's actually creating the dummy variables for you. Correct. But if you're going to use some of these machine learning models or like clusters, you might cluster analysis, you might have to create a yeah. sparse matrix. Um, but it does do it under the hood, which is another plus like Python. I've always had problems with building models because I always have to convert everything to dummies. Remember to and, do that. Yeah. yeah, it's like a mess. All right. <laughs> but yeah. All right. So now we've got our train X. Sorry to go on that random tangent. Actually, no, yeah. sorry. This is good content. Yeah, it's, it's for the content. Uh, and then we're going to take train cleaned and we're going to pull out pitch type numeric and yep. set that to be our Y axis or train yep. Y. And same exact thing for test. All right, so now we've got our, our data set up as matrices, but XGBoost now has another layer on top of that where they have this custom object that they create. I'm assuming it's so that it can like send it off to C or do some back end stuff that makes XGBoost run silly fast. Uh, we it just we just have to do this. So just one of those things. One of those <laughs> things. So uh, XGBoost has this function XGB.dmatrix. So XGB dense matrix. Uh, the data it takes is the that new matrix that we made, and then the labels. So the tags. So the outcomes that we're trying to predict uh, are set to label. So we create those. And we do that for both test and train. So we have our test data set and our training data set. And so now we've actually done all the manipulations we need to to the input data. Now we get to actually using Do XG something. Boost. <laughs> Bared with us for eight minutes. XG Boost. Patrick, what's going on here? Okay, XG Boost. So, like I said, continuation of last week, we did trees, which are weak learners. And then we did random forest, which takes a whole bunch of weak learners and uses some uh, some resampling, some bootstrapping to basically get random samples and try and create a bunch of trees and then take the out of bag sample rate to see like, OK, you know, using a, a wisdom of the crowds approach of these weak learners, how well did we do um, extreme uh, gradient boosted XG boost? Uh, takes that to another level by, again, using the same weak learner type of, of approach. And it creates these uh, extreme, bo extreme gradient boosted trees where at each, you know, after each tree, it's trying to increase its learning rate and basically doing this n number of times, however many times um, that you want to set it to. It was actually developed by a guy here at U UW. And um, if you've ever been on Kaggle, like I feel like four years ago or so, this was all the rage. Everyone, um, XG Boost was just beating yeah. out everybody. It, all it's the an time. algorithm that is really competitive with you know neural networks and random forests. It's very competitive, and um, we're gonna do a bunch of stuff here with just the base uh, uh, default settings, and then we're gonna show you how to optimize it. But honestly. 
the XG boost with the default settings does pretty darn well. They, they chose some uh, anyway. pretty darn good defaults. Exactly. <laughs> so um, the first thing we've already we've already prepped all the data. Um, we don't need to do any sort of pre-processing on our data here. The first thing that we're going to do, we're going to train our model. We just need to get the number of classes uh, in in our uh, dependent variable, which is nine, right? We created a factor uh, or a numeric of zero to nine. Okay, so so there's really ten. Sorry, but it's no, no, there's there nine. There yeah, nine. There's nine. Yeah, zero to nine. Uh, okay, so. We're going to create a list of model parameters. I just create this outside of the XG boost function itself so that it's not muddied up with a whole bunch of stuff inside. So I'm going to create this model parameters. The evaluation metric is that we're going to use um, M log loss for multiple class log loss. Log loss is just a common uh, way of evaluating models based on the distance of the probability of the uh, uh, of the observed class or the distance of the probability of the predicted class to the observed class. So rather than using something binary like accuracy, yes or no, we're going to use log loss to account for the, the probabilities and how close we are to the actual class. The number of classes is the number of pitches that we just specified up top. And uh, the objective is that we need to make sure that um, XGBoost knows that we have multiple classes, right? Like if this was binary, we could set it to binary. This, this is multi-class, so we're setting this to multi-class soft prob. So we run those model parameters. And the one other thing that I do before we run this is I like to set a watch list. And so what you're going to see when we run the XGBoost model is it's going to be printing on the screen in the console down below every iteration. Every iteration. Uh, that it's going through. It's going to be pr uh, producing the error rate of every iteration of the 1,000 times or however, you know, how many times we run it. Um, so I set the watch list to basically say, hey, I want to see the train error rate, but I also want to see a test error rate because I want to see as it's going through this, um, is there an offset between the two or are we potentially overfitting? This is going to be a way for us to evaluate our model. So we set the watch list and now we're ready to train the model. We use the XGB train function. So we're going to specify that, that data matrix that we created with the XG boost specific data matrix as our, um, as our uh, data for the model. The max depth we're going to set is three. That's just the default parameter. That's the tree depth. We're going to run it for 1,000 rounds while we evaluate the train and test set error rates in our watch list. Um, we have the n, n threads is basically saying like we're going to run in parallel three, um, run this three times in parallel, right? So instead of just doing one time through, second time through, third time through. Uh, yeah, as opposed to running in theory, in serial. Uh, in series, serial, yeah, in, in series. Serial, yeah, right. It's going to run it across three different threads. It's just a, it's just a way to improve the improve speed at speed. which. Yeah. Um, the more threads you have, the faster things fit. Um, now, I usually, if I'm training the model, I don't set this next parameter, but I set it here just so that we can, you know, go through this quick. I set this early stopping rule, and basically, this early stopping rule is saying if the error rate doesn't improve in the kind of rolling ten as we're going through those thousand, just kill it. Stop where, stop right there. No need to go further. Usually what I would do is, is not use that, and I would actually um, let it run for the full 1,000, and then I would evaluate the model like we're going to do in a second, and I would find the, the, uh, I would find the, the minimum, and then I would build the model off of mm -hmm. that. But we're going to stop it. Yeah, because what's, um, what's then, happening here is there could be a point where it's finding a local minima, but not the um, overall minima. Correct, uh, because the, the, we're doing extreme gradient boosting. So we're using like a gradient descent, and so you could do... Yeah. yeah. Eventually, you're going to hit hit bottom, and you could get stuck, or you know, there's all kinds of things that can happen. We'll probably talk about that when we talk about neural networks. Yes, that's uh, a big deal with neural the networks. Next, yeah, in the next uh, yeah. week or so. All right, but so we'll let this train. Oh, and then we'll I guess train, the last thing is params, which are the parameters we set. Feed it your model parameters, right? Yep. All right. Let's go ahead and, and run it. Go. And you're going to see <laughs> this pretty darn quick. You can see the train log loss uh, occurring on the left side, the test log loss occurring on the right side, and it looks like we've stopped. So we set it for 1,000, and we stopped at 161. Uh, sorry, yeah, we, best we iteration was 151. Okay. We stopped at 161, but rolling that back 10, the best iteration was, the, uh, was at 151 um, rounds of the model running. 
So we can get some model information, which we get right there real quick. Um, just kind of gives us a, an oh. overview of what we actually did and, and ran. And now we can evaluate this model. So we can um, make some plots of these uh, error rates. Actually, that uh, yeah, okay. Yep, so right here. We're, it's not error rate, it's actually log loss, but um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know why I typed that. But um, <laughs> tomato potato. We're gonna, we're gonna create a data frame. So we're gonna take our uh, evaluation log um, of our model, and that gives us two columns and the iteration number. So three columns, iteration number, test log loss and train log, or train log loss and test log loss. And we're gonna just make two little plots of those. So the first one, oh. oops. The first one's going to be our uh, training log loss. And the red line is gonna be the test log loss. So you can see there's a point where um, the model starts to sort of balance out and we're not really getting any more improvement, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we set it at a at a stopping, you know, an early stopping criteria. If I didn't set that early stopping criteria, the next piece comes in handy here, which is find the iteration where the log loss is minimized. So if we run this, it should tell us what we uh, already know yeah. because let's, of our early stop. Let's quickly run through this to, to explain. Yeah. So we take that log loss data frame that we created and we click minimum here and it says the minimum log loss was uh, in the test set was 0.656 and so we might be thinking huh where did that happen so we can um, find that by doing a little bit of uh, um, uh, we basically take that log loss uh, data frame and we say hey in the when the test log loss equals the minimum log loss in that test column return back the um the row that that was in so if we hit that we find our iteration 151 which we found already from running the model because we set this the early stopping uh, criteria um, you could do this with which min as the same thing it's basically a way of testing the or, uh, uh, identifying which is the minimum column that's mm -hmm. fine uh, so we have a best iteration it's at 151 and we're just going to take that number and there it is 151 and we're going to train our final model or build our final model xg boost we give it our, our special matrix we set the max depth to three we set the end rounds to be the best iteration which was 151 we run it three times in par oh, we run three parallel uh models and our parameters stayed the same and now we have a final model that we can go ahead and test on the test data set and see how well we did so yep. Oh, but first let's look at the uh, Oh yeah, let's importance. look at very little importance in this final. So importance tells us how important, how significant, how, how much of a driver is yeah. each uh, parameter that we feed into it. So first we call XGB importance. You have to set model equal this. The first argument that goes into XGB importance is actually feature names. So you have to, the second one is model, so you have to set that one there, which I thought was interesting. It stumped us for a moment, so I wanted to bring that up with y'all. Um, and now we're going to plot it in XGB, or XGB XG boost has this xgb.ggplot.importance mm -hmm. uh, function here. Um, Too small. Gotta, gotta pull that out there. Here, let's do dev. Dev off. Uh, all right, I, I should raise an issue with uh, our studio that they need to fix that. <laughs> if it doesn't That's print, cool. stop it. All right, anyway, so here is the feature importance. Oh, look at that. All so right. we know from our random forest pitch Z and, and from our decision trees, pitch Z and X and uh, start speed um, seem to tell us, you know, most seem to be the most valuable at splitting this data when I'm trying to identify pitch types. And I think with this, because it's a GG plot, you can actually add a plus after that function and use like you could change the theme to classic. I think you can do all the same, I believe, all the same ggplot-esque. Yeah, yeah it changed the title. It's just returning a ggplot object. Exactly, so. so you could do all the, you know, theming that you wanted if you wanted to make this look nice. Yeah. If you wanted to bring this into your executives, I definitely suggest you uh, you style your, your plots here and be yeah, like, yeah, yeah, look yeah. at this. <laughs> so that's... You so thought there, there this one feature was gonna be, you, you thought end speed was gonna be the thing that really defined right. what the pitch was. Well, I'm here to tell you actually, start speed and the uh, z movement z yes. movement yeah is the most important one and yeah. after that it's the x movement and after that it is the start speed yeah interpretation model interpretation 
And so if you were building a simpler model, you, you could probably, um, you could probably get rid of some of those lower, <laughs> some of those lower yeah. values and, um, even build like a simpler tree with, with the, you know, the few, something that I guess is easier for a decision maker to interpret, uh, mm-hmm. which is one of the limitations of XG boost is it can be rather black boxy and you're like, Ooh, what? Not really sure how this decision was made. There's lots of stuff going on. In it. Yes, um, exactly. So if but, you can reduce the, the number of parameters going yeah, into it yeah, while not yeah. losing accuracy or too much accuracy. Yes. No matter what, you're always going to lose accuracy when you remove. Well, not always. Yeah. But you're usually going to lose accuracy when you remove information, but it should get yeah. better. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, and All then right. we're just going to throw this in on the test set before we try and tune this bad boy. Um mm-hmm. So we're gonna create some predictions. Uh, This is similar to what we did before last week. Uh, We predict on the, using the XG boosted data with new data, which is our test data. Uh, It's gonna come out in a matrix-esque form. So we're just gonna convert it using data frame by piping that in, in tidyverse. And then we're going to set the column names again, because it's a matrix. If you just ran that, it's gonna set the column names to V1, V2, V3, all the way to V9. We're going to set those to the pitch type name and then mutating across everything. Um, so mutating across all of the nine columns, we just run around all the variables, uh, all the uh, data points to three so that it doesn't look like a bunch of um, percentages. Yep. Now we have this cool kind of thing here. This would be a great um, little piece to throw into, I think, in like episode 50, where we did the interactive shiny, where you could exactly. change information and show how probabilities see, of see, different see which one's being change. predicted yeah right and then we wow. can uh yep. calculate our predicted pitch by going okay what is the maximum column for each row here and yep. then uh, assigning the pitch type from that converting it back into a factor so that it maintains its order um so we run that so now we have the predicted and now we're going to want to add in the actual one. So we're going to pull from to test clean, assign the pitch type into the original pitch type column. And then take a quick head of that. So we go. have all the predictions, percentages, the actual, the, the predicted pitch type, which is the maximum predicted from that and the original pitch type. And so you can so see like here. So like row one, we're way off, right? Yeah. We had our model thought 49% probability of being FT um, and only a about a 4% probability of being FC, which is the actual class was the original pitch type was FC and our model Mm -hmm. thought it wasn't FC. Yeah, so alrighty. So now we can go through and actually evaluate how often were we off like that. (laughs) And so we can quickly use the janitor table to make this nice confusion matrix. As we can see, I mean, it's looking very similar to all the other ones that we've done in the past. Uh, now we can get our overall accuracy, so the sum of the ones that were correct, so along the diagonal, divided by the total number of predictions we made. So we're at 74, 75%, mm-hmm. which is exactly what we've gotten in the past. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now we can look at within pitch type accuracy again, and we're <laughs> seeing the same patterns Mm-hmm. where uh, the four-seam fastball, which is the most commonly thrown one, gets the most matches and the highest accuracy. The slider, the second most thrown, high accuracy. The change-up, not the second most thrown, but it's different enough from the four-seam fastball that it also gets fairly accurate in the change-up. So if we're seeing a pattern here where class imbalance is really driving a lot of... yeah. Inaccuracy. And the, the other bit of information that's really important here is that we are using a more complex model and it's not even that much better than the simple, very, the very simple weak learner decision tree on its own, mm-hmm. um, which is, which is both good and bad. It's good because it means that we don't need a more complex model. Uh, and it's bad because we need to start to figure out ways to improve our accuracy a little bit more um, if we were to productionalize this model. Yes. And we need to start thinking more about we can't just throw it into an algorithm and expect the algorithm to handle things for us at this point. This is right. showing that there is cla- there, there's something inherently in the data we need to start addressing. Which could be the class imbalance thing, which we can talk about, or it could be that we need other features, maybe the types of pitchers, similar types of pitchers throw similar ways, et cetera, et cetera. This is how 
model iterations work. Mm -hmm. um, we can do a quick thing on optimizing the parameters. So like all machine learning models, there's little uh, levers and buttons to push to try and make things better. Um, and XG Boost is no different. In fact, it has many, <laughs> so many buttons to push. I've, I've put down a little list for classification below this chunk that um, kind of gives you some of the things that you can optimize and uh, the, um, the default values and things like that. Uh, so if you want to peruse those, yeah, you can we've, we've certainly go right through here. I've dumped that in there. But um, ours, we are going to keep it very simple. And we've already run this. It took, what, like five minutes when running it in parallel? And this was after us fiddling around and monkeying Two, around yeah. with things to try to make it run faster. So right. this is yeah. the type of situation where supermassive computers, lots of parallel processing, running it on AWS, Azure, yeah, wherever. Running a bunch of clusters of it, yeah. Or just accepting that it's going to take a long time. Run it, and, go watch your favorite movie. Yeah. Come back yeah. to it later. Hopefully it'll it, be done. Exactly. So Machine we'll just, learning is becoming more of a brute force method rather than a <laughs> elegance yeah. in, in mathematics. Yeah. As, as a, not, not to talk poorly of, of anybody. Yeah. That is not the intent here. It's just like that's... If you're going to do a good search, that's what it is. Yeah. So um, so this is the same stuff that we did last week, right? Where it's train control. We're going to do repeated CV. So it's going to uh, cross-validation. Uh, one repeat, so we're being lazy because uh, we're trying to make it fast. Uh, we're going to do three uh, classes. Um, try to predict class probabilities, and we're going to allow it to run in parallel. And then the grid that we're going to be searching across this was more complicated. Once again, we simplified it <laughs> yeah. to try to make it run faster. But yeah. all of these things you can tune. All of these you can change. Yeah. You can change the number of rounds, so the number of iterations it does, the eta, which is the learning rate, the, the gamma, the, the number of columns it samples by tree, the minimum child weight, the uh, subsample, and the depth, which is the depth of the trees. Yeah. And uh, the ADA, we don't need the concatenate there. We had originally put multiple values. So all of these are at the default value with the exception of max depth. Um, and it, again, yeah. below in the notes, you can read exactly what these things are and what the default values and the common ranges are if you wanted to play more with this. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, we just create this grid. So if you were to run that and then show the, what the grid looks like, uh, the expand grid, or if you're in tidyverse, you use crossings is the same type of function. It's just going to... Um, find every iteration of the, or every combination rather. So obviously our grid is relatively small because the only thing that we had was max depth. If we changed ETA, ETA to like four different numbers, <laughs> right? Like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, yeah, and then if we ran that again, now we'd have this, you know, larger it grid. And by a factor. So, and so you could think about if we were to, you know, re, yeah, exactly. If we were to, uh, parameterize each of those with with unique values we would start to have this really big grid that would take longer and longer to run so we stuck with the default values with the exception of the tree depth just because we were curious which, if that really impacted it right which we set from basically a value of two to eight by two so two four six and eight yeah. um and we so here we go and then this is the, yep. the training that we we do here so we tried to make it faster with parallelization. I have eight cores on my machine, but in order so I could actually still do stuff, I took seven of them um, and registered in a cluster with the do parallel that we had earlier, set the seed to seven so we had some consistency, we hope, um, and then train it like everything else. The nice thing about Carrot is it provides a consistent interface for all the different models that you're yes. gonna use. And and so, so notice you don't have to do the matrix stuff here. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to convert to special matrix and stuff. It's going to do that under the hood for you. Exactly. Um, because they've, they've already come up with the way to handle XG or uh, XG boost. We believe the equivalent in tr uh, carrot was XGB tree. Um, that, at least that was the closest that we could find that had the same parameters there. Same, the, the training control there, the grid that we want it to be trained across, the metric we care about, so the model selection at the very end is based off of accuracy, and right. then be verbose, print a lot of stuff so we know what's going on as we go. Yeah. It ran. And we, cho we chose accuracy because uh, log loss wasn't an option for them mm -hmm. in Carrot. Yeah, and so this ran for a while, like we said, five minutes, so we're not gonna run this. 
But after it completed, we saved it as an RDS file, which we will bring up now. And ba -doop, here we go. So all right, pretend we've, we've run this, we've left, we got coffee, we came back. Here, our stuff's done. Done. Here we go, this is what's printed now. Cool. All right, so it's done extreme gradient boosting, 26,000 samples, 10 predictors, nine classes. Here, here's what it looked across because the only thing that was changing was max depth. It's gonna show, okay, across these, the best accuracy we got was 80% on the test, train, the, train, train data train, set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Training data set. Um, so here are the different parameters you can look at that comes out of carrot, it's fairly consistent. You can look at your results here. So these are all the results of all the information contained. Um, if you want to figure out which one's the maximum one, even though it, it tells us here, you can go, all right, which is the maximum accuracy? Or you could look at a different one. What's the minimum error? Or what is, I mean, it depends on what exactly you're looking at. You, you could use other variables. Like accuracy and kappa are there, but I think you could set ROC or AUC as well as, as parameters. You could have yep. other parameters to look exactly. at. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, so here are all the parameters that we that it selected as creme de la creme based on what you gave me. These are the best. This is the best one to be using. Yeah. Sorry. So now I know that. So these are all the notes here. We won't really go into depth on these. Um, just know that there are lots of knobs. <laughs> Yeah, lots of knobs you can do, and you can very easily tune them with Carrot. It just takes time. C correct. Uh, the other thing Carrot didn't have because one of the things that takes time is that uh, you. I don't think maybe you can, but I don't think you can specify an early stopping uh, mechanism. So it ran one thousand trees. What we could do is take the information that we've learned in our tuning. So we could go back and use XG Boost, the XG Boost package, and rebuild our model setting the eta to 0 0.01, setting the max depth to eight, and then setting the end rounds to a thousand with an early stopping of 10. And we can find the best model from there. Uh, we're not gonna do that. You could certainly do that yourself. Just go back up and change the parameters. But um, yeah. there's, our, there's a, a picture of our accuracy as the tree depth increased along the, um, obviously there's only dots at two, four, six, and eight, because that was the sequence that we ran. We didn't run every number from two to yeah. eight and the, the slope of this it. also tells me that it could probably get better mm -hmm. but once again we stopped it so that we didn't spend all day looking at it mm -hmm. um here now we're going to do the predictions so once again because carrot has a very consistent uh mechanism for us to be drawing the results out of so we're going to bind columns with the test cleaned which is the actual data then we're going to calculate or use predict uh, give us the pred column on pitch tune with our new test clean data set and the type we have is raw which is the actual actual yep. call to have here so now we end up with this data set where we have the actual pitch type the pitch type num and the predicted one that we end yeah. up here so now we can throw this into our table or a janitor table to get our confusion matrix. Yeah. Look at that. It's not looking very different. Similar-ish. <laughs> it's, it's just not getting better. No. Nope. We, we trained our model. We tuned. We sat. We, 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 uh, we sat around as things were running. So aside from class imbalance, we're clearly missing some extra information that might help us split this data a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, into uh, partition the data better or partition yeah. the pitch types better. Yeah, here's a confusion matrix from Carrot around everything that's going on. So the summary. So really, our accuracy is seventy five percent still. Lot lot of work for a one percent improvement. <laughs> yeah, not even. <laughs> not even. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, y'all. Machine learning is not the answer for everything. Mm -hmm. At least not yet. Uh, and then we can look at this. This is also our personal calculation of the actual accuracy. So yeah. take the diagonal. So those are the correctly, correctly guessed classes and dividing by the total number of pitches. Yeah. So there we go. And this is so, XG Boost, a much more complicated model to not be better. <laughs> at least not yet. We, we not have a, some more work to do. Not yet. We will be yeah. better. We promise. Mm -hmm. All right. And then with that, I think we can call it. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for joining us for episode 56. We appreciate all of you subscribing. We're almost to 1,000 subscribers, so tell all your friends, tell everybody. If you watch this, please subscribe. We really appreciate um, your comments and, and your feedback and whatnot, so we love to hear from you all. So let us know. As always, my name is Ellis Hughes, and you can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And my name is Patrick Gordon. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And the screencast is Tidy X, which can be found on Twitter at, at Tidy underscore explained or Gmailed comments, questions in at Tidy dot explained at gmail.com. Or you can open up a issue on the GitHub repo, which I'm going to do today on feature engineering. So we can put together some stuff on that for later uh, to remind us to do that later. Or you can subscribe, uh, as Ella said, to the YouTube channel and leave some comments and questions and thoughts and ideas. And that's yeah. XG Boost. That's XG Boost, <laughs> y'all. Keep on exploring your world. <laughs>